Just a quick note before we begin today. This episode is recorded in mid-October, which is before Breakpoint, before the recent market rally, before the renewed interest, excitement, and attention that the Solana ecosystem is getting. But this conversation and the tools that Armada and SciFi have built out are really important to focus on, I think now more than ever. Uh, going into these more raucous market cycles, uh, this is something where the fundamentals really matter. And the tools that groups like Armada have built out that can help people do sustainable and well-thought-out token launches uh, become even more important when more noise enters the ecosystem, more tourists enter the ecosystem. And so if the tone and tenor of this conversation feels a little depressed at times, I, I think that's because it does reflect how people were feeling in the beginning of October, that we needed tools like this for whenever the market decides to come back. And we may be in that cycle, we may not be in that cycle. And, and that's why this conversation is still relevant today. Tommy, welcome to Validated. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, excited for this one today. Uh, there's a bunch we can talk about. Um, I want to talk a bit about your journey into the space and sort of your journey into building stuff on Solana. I want to talk about PsyOptions. I want to talk about Armada as well. Uh, but let's start out with you. Give me a little bit of your background and, and sort of how you got into this crazy world. Yeah, I mean, we have to go back to 2016 when I st first started really getting into crypto, started doing some part-time smart contract development on Ethereum, never really went full-time there, didn't have anything take off, started paying attention to Solana after Multicoin was tweeting about it in 2018. And shortly after Solana went to mainnet in 2020, I started diving into just hacking around and, and getting uh, you know, some reps with some code. So that was kind of the, the beginning of how I really got sucked into Solana. What was that unlock for you going from, oh, I'm like, playing around and stuff on Ethereum, but I don't feel like this is something I necessarily want to dive into full time to looking at Solana and saying like, yeah, actually, this is something I want to do full time. There was never this, this is what I want to do full time. I was always super interested in blockchain. Um, I think timing was good with Solana. I had really grown as an engineer and was a team lead in, in my day job. And so I could really build anything start to finish and wanted to hack on something new. I had the pain points of developing with uh, Solidity on Ethereum and the speed of the blockchain and seeing what Solana promised, that's what brought me really to, to just focusing on Solana in my spare time, bootlining some projects. Uh, but what, what really took me full time was winning a, a hackathon, the first Solana DeFi hackathon in February of, I believe that was 2021. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had no plans to go full time. We built just options an options primitive and took first place. And all of a sudden investors are reaching out, looking to invest. And so then we had to set up a business entity and raise funds and all that fun stuff. And, and that's what really kind of pushed us to uh, to jump full at time. Yeah, it's such a wild moment to go back to like those early days of 2021 when basically no one knew about Solana still at that point. Like I joined in January of 21, it was still like very unknown at that point. Um, and and so like talk to me a little bit about that hackathon process back before these. If, if folks are familiar with Solana hackathons now, they're, they're, they're an experience. They're a whole production. Um, it's the, I, I think the highest number of attendees in any Web3 hackathon is the, you know, the one the Solana Foundation runs three times a year. But this was only the second hackathon that Solana had done. This was the first official one. The first one was that wormhole DeFi V0 yep. hackathon that, you know, was, was sort of cobbled together. But this was the first, like, serious one. Like, wh what was that process like of going through that? Oh, I mean, I was also a part of the one in November. Like, the yeah. very, very first okay. one that wasn't even, like, that was just very hacked together, but did in place. I mean, my brother and I, we submitted a, our submission was... We built a trusted third-party Oracle. So it's kind of like the very basic building blocks of what Switchboard is today. Um, and our presentation was just uh, printing out on like a terminal. And so like no UI, nothing sexy. So of course we did it in place. It was more developer tooling and just getting used to it. Uh, but that, that, was a, that was a fun learning experience. 
But so then once the next one was was announced, it was definitely a lot more put together, a little bit less chaotic in, in terms of getting help and um, you know resources from the Solana Discord and the community and actually Solana Labs members. Um, and there was actually presentations. I remember there was, and it, it was a lot, uh, there was a lot less noise, right? I remember, yeah. um, you know, some of the Solana Labs developers giving a few core presentations on how to write a, a simple smart contract or, I mean, just doing more office, like a, an office hour here and there, but it wasn't as scheduled and robust. It was more of like, hey, I'm, I'm down to host a, a office hour. So it was, it was definitely an interesting um, you know, time, but it was also very, like, I would say the community was much more intimate. Like it, you have a lot more close connections, a lot less noise back then. Yeah. It's also funny to think that was back in the time when there were so few projects that they could all be manually reviewed by just a few people. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think there was like, Uh, yeah, that taught that initial, I mean, one of the crazy stats that like I was talking with Maddie about the first one was like, I think six weeks after Maddie was hired and this, this was this one that you were in was the first real one that he ran, but I think it was it was something along the lines of um, the projects that won that first one in in November that you guys first entered, like they wouldn't even place nowadays for the most part in like the hackathon. Yeah. Just the, the the quality has increased so dramatically in what we've seen there, and so that's kind of cool to hear about the early days of of what that one was like for you guys. Yeah. We're basically just about two years past that at this point now, um, as we're sitting here today recording. So I want to get into some of the stuff you guys have been doing recently and sort of this announcement around Armada. Um, it, it feels like uh, the last maybe three months stuff has started really heating back up in DeFi, but the previous almost year before that was like a pretty sleepy time. What have you guys been been working on? Yeah, I mean, sleepy time for the marketing and growth people, but for us engineers, right, it's like yeah. there's less noise, it's easier to build. Um, so for us, I mean, Armada came about because Sci Finance, formerly Sci Options, and Hero were chatting. We were just talking about the pain points we'd seen with launching a token and getting liquidity on those tokens and governance and everything under the sun of like, okay, you you have this token outside of like your business and the core like protocol or programs you're building. Like there's all this other infrastructure to get from, uh, you know, we have a protocol to decentralized organization and and tokenomics and governance driven tokenomics, which is very important. Yeah. Um, And so we started just, and then there was a teams that were reaching out, um, to a few groups that were saying, hey, we want to launch a token, but we have, you know, there's this infrastructure on Ethereum, but it doesn't exist on Solana. And so that's kind of where we started was like, hey, let's help, let's build this infrastructure for these teams who are going to want to launch tokens um, and build some, you know, a liquidity bootstrapping curve, basically an auction mechanism uh, where price can start high. And if no one's buying, it goes lower. But when people buy, the price jumps up. So there's there's this auction mechanism that has price discovery um, in it. Um, and then, well, once you have a token, like what else do you do with that? Well, you need to get liquidity on the token. Otherwise, like you have no ecosystem. If there's no liquidity, like why are people going to be holding this thing? Or, you know, if they want to be able to get out in and out, um, there needs to be liquidity. So that's kind of like step two of like a token is getting liquidity and incentivizing that. Yeah. And so everything we just announced with Arbata is, is, those core components, helping teams launch tokens, helping teams get liquid, robust liquidity on tokens and incentivizing those liquidity, that liquidity. So it felt like we went from an era in like early 2021 where it was like, oh, you got a white paper, launch a token to sort of a, you know, late 2022 market where it was very much like, are you sure you want to launch a token? Should you actually yeah. be doing this? Like, have you thought this through? I mean, like, classic example is something like ApeCoin, like what is it there for? What does it do? Why does it exist? And that, that was a very different market than sort of the area that you you sort of came up in. Um, yep. So walk me through a little bit about that conversation with Armada thinking like, you know what, people actually need tools to launch tokens better. Like what what is what has changed um, in the view of this sort of coalition that came together to build this thing to be like, Nah, like we we can do token launches again. In fact, we actually should be doing them. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of good organizations that have built um, platforms that are still getting some sort of traction in the bear market, or continue to build platforms that um, that are going to get traction as interest rates change and the macro environment changes. And so it's like there's there's always going to be need a need to launch tokens. And so like how do you you know building the infrastructure to do that in a fair way, in a decentralized way. Um, I mean, the infrastructure we're building, this is not a launch pad. Like we yeah. have to make that clear. Like this is like software we're just handing over um, UIs that can be customized with your, you know, the team's branding and they self-host it. Um, so we just kind of rethought like we don't want to do a launch pad because I think back in the heyday of 2021, like launch pads were scammy, but that was that environment, right? Everyone wanted to like ape into the next thing. Um, yeah. And so everyone would pay attention to the launch pads. But this is de- definitely more a, a more thoughtful approach, um, just like the current environment where people are being more thoughtful of whether they should and should not launch tokens. I don't think, you know, there's a million tokens out there. There doesn't need to be a million more. Yeah. Um, so I think it really, you know, tokens can kind of um, create noise in determining whether you have product market fit and things like that. But they're also good mechanisms for incentivizing and creating a community. So you kind of have to like really weigh your goals and current market conditions and current community and and what they want out of it and what the core development team wants out of it, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, one of the token challenges has always been that it puts a lot of pressure on the team to focus on something that maybe they're actually not focused on, right? It's the, it's the same thing about like, not to equate tokens to equity, but when a startup goes public, you actually generally see them getting worse, right? Most publicly yep. traded companies are worse run than privately held companies, and that's not an accident. That's because every quarter number go up or else like board get fired, right? And yep. like either, there is a component of crypto where if you launch a token uh, too early, it can, well, not too, I, too early is a hard way to say it, but if you launch a token early, it is hard to figure out what that, um, what the reason for that token is. And not necessarily that the founders haven't figured that out. It's that the external pressures come at you pretty strong and that can totally change the dynamic of what a project is actually designed to do. Totally. Um, I mean, case in point, <laughs> Psy options and that token, right? Like, I mean, we, we spent, we went from focusing, I mean, we have two contributing teams now and one's still very heavily focused on like structured products and and uh, options and stuff. But, you know, a whole the whole other contributing team that I'm a part of, we started focusing on like, well, how do we spin up governance and getting involved in SPL governance and realms and, sure. you know, writing programs for like treasury management and, uh, you know, contributing to the voter stake registry because you need certain like, you, you have this design that you want to meet with how the community gets involved and whatnot. So like, yeah, it is a huge distraction. Um, and I think, you know, that definitely, I mean, for us, it cl- clearly like we, we had to split priorities. Uh, and so the goal of Armada, right, is to just take this, like all the learnings and that, and the time that we spent so that the next group of, uh, organizations launching tokens don't have to think about this stuff. It's all kind of out of the box for them. Yeah, I want to spend some time on that in a minute, digging into like what that split was like, how, like quite frankly, how that was structured, like how you guys came about making those decisions. But sort of before we get into that, what is the framework that Armada operates under in terms of like its sustainability and over the long term? Because I think you look at the launch pads and the idea there was always well, we'll take a certain percentage of token supply, and if we have enough volume through, we'll have enough money at the end of the day, this thing works out. And the problem with launch pads is they were always incentivized for volume over quality. Um, yep. So how, how is Armada like structured financially at that point? Yeah, so I think that just like the product, like the financial model, like we will, you know, iterate on that. Uh, but what we're going to market with is we have the concentrated liquidity market making vaults which is where users and projects and teams can kind of delegate liquidity after a token's launched uh, to an institutional market maker that just has certain permissions to manage um, positions on an underlying concentrated liquidity pool, currently Orca's Whirlpools. Um, and so there will be fees taken from, um, you know, trading volumes there. And so it really, you know, to, to go back to your question of like, how do you go quality over quantity, right? 
I mean, you want quality trading volume over sus- like a sustainable amount of time, and you're not going to just push out a million projects that are going to, you know, trade for a day and then do nothing. Right. Like you want, you want projects that are building real infrastructure that's going to be around for a while um, and are building quality tokenomics models or quality uh, ecosystems with flywheels that is going to create more sustainable volumes over time. Um, and so that's kind of where we're really diving in with these teams. Yeah. So I know you are not a lawyer, but I do want to ask a little bit about the legal (laughs) structure um, that this is all done under because, you know, there's a fine line between making tools to make making markets easier and stuff that begins to raise the hackles of, if not regulators, then at least a, a team's internal legal folks being like, wait a minute, we have to figure out exactly where this money that we're contributing to this vault goes for. So how did you guys get comfortable with basically building those types of tools? Uh, lots of legal bills. <laughs> that's that's yeah. the answer, right? If you're not a lawyer, that's the answer. Um, but no, I mean, we also have like a, the. I mean, I'll, I'll dive into like the entity structure. I think it's interesting for for teams that are, you know, launching and want to launch how they, how they handle things. But there's like an offshore foundation, which then has service level, like service agreements with, um, you know, onshore, um, like tech or service providers, right? Yeah. Um, and so that offshore foundation is set up by lawyers and, you know, core contributors, not team members of that, you know, and we had all that set up in 2021. Granted, like regulation is like constantly changing and, you know, whether some paperwork and all these other things like really shield you is clearly up in the air. Um, so like, we're very thoughtful with like the risks that we're taking, but we also know different teams have different risk profiles. And so that's where the the way we've kind of built this platform from the ground up is so that way teams can uh, deploy their own sites um, on their own subdomains and they can put whatever, um, you know, restrictions that they want in front of their users. Yeah. Uh, they can run whatever auction styles that they want. Um, so it's, something where we we pay attention to this stuff all the time. I mean, the Ripple stuff is like very interesting for pool-based token launches. Right. Um, but it's like constantly changing. So lots of legal pills. That's fair. So uh, I want to go back to something you were you were alluding to earlier, which is that the launch of a token for you guys actually necessitated such a work stream split that you ended up basically creating two separate core contributor organizations. Walk me through a little bit about what that conversation was like when you were saying, hey, we actually kind of need to break this up into a few different entities. Yeah. Well, so the decision was never about like we need a separate entity, but when we actually, we acquired Tap Finance to run structured products for like the sci-fi DAO back in January of 2022. And so they're a group out of Singapore um, and they kind of host all the, the side finance stuff and, and the engineering behind that. Um, and so they were working on a lending product at the time. And we had some contributors from the US team uh, working on that as well. Um, but so the core focus was on that lending and structured products. But as we were launching a token in January 2022 and, and handling like all the legal work for that. Great time to launch a token. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it was, it's, you look at the chart, it's very, very, Great time. But okay, back to the uh, the decisions on splitting. So, you know, we were so focused on like the token and then, well, once you launch a token, you know, like, what do you do with that token? So you kind of need to go through like, all right, well, we need governance. Why do we need governance? We need tokenomics. And like, so you kind of have this whole, you kind of have to get going on like building all that infrastructure. So your community and token holders have things to do um, that actually impact and drive the ecosystem. Otherwise, like, it, your governance token is a gimmick. And most, I mean, to, to date, most governance tokens are gimmicks. They're like, to the ape coin, like, what are you doing with it? Um, so it just kind of came about of, you know, a certain, like our group was focused a lot on the, the token launch and, and getting that ready. Uh, and Singapore group was just like heads down, still working on like the structured products and lending stuff. So it kind of just naturally came about that like, hey, we're going to like, contribute to like the governance infrastructure because like we need we want our communities asking for x y and z functionality and realms and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff so um but this kind of came pretty expensive. fairly naturally right like it's, it's obviously spinning up a, a second team or you know staffing a second team focused on this type of work is not cheap 
and it's not necessarily not directly related. I mean, it's one of those things where it's operationally related to running the core protocol, but it is not directly financially related to that core protocol. So, you know, f- from quite frankly, just like a treasury allocation perspective, like uh, w- what was that like when you guys are like, oh man, like we actually need to build a lot of these tools and it's going to be expensive and it's not necessarily going to make our core financial products any stronger. Yeah. Um, it, so I think a lot of it comes from like community and need, you know, there's, it's not gonna make the financial product stronger, but it, it could make the community stronger. Yeah. Granted when you're fighting against a, a bear market and things are just going down and, you know, uh, FTX bankruptcy and three arrows Never and all that stuff it. and Luna crash. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, you know, you have a lot of headwinds against you and you're building this infrastructure. You've been building this infrastructure for community, but community is just going out of the entire ecosystem. So, you know, it's a failed bet, but uh, there's a lot of learnings along the way. And I think it, so, I mean, as far as it is expensive to like contribute there and you apply, we applied for some grants and got some grants from the Solana Foundation, but those grants, they don't cover the cost of engineering, right? right. They don't cover like cost of audits. It's a more of a subsidy. Um, but I, you know, this is, this is infrastructure like that the entire ecosystem needs. And, you know, we're kind of just viewing it some as a, like more public goods and they become more top of the funnel for uh, other projects downstream. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've had teams just like with our governance infrastructure and knowledge from contributing there, you know, teams have reached out that, you know, asking how we set up the voter stake registry and how we set up realms and asking for demos and all that kind of stuff. So it, it definitely helps a little bit with like the branding and recognition inside the ecosystem. But um, but it is definitely not, um, I, I think like if we didn't pivot or not pivot, but if we didn't also work on like Armada, it would be a lot of like sunk costs. So that's why hopefully, yeah. you know, Armada can take that away from others. I mean, it's, it's at least, I, I think, I think if I actually did the accounting, like it's probably in the, approaching seven figures on the investment into like governance and tokenomics related stuff. Yeah. I mean, that that's one of the great things about seeing Armada is like there, there's not a bunch of folks who have made a bet to say, we're going to build tooling for this stuff. And then also we're going to basically take that and if not make it free and make it incredibly accessible for folks to be able to, to sort of access. Like, uh, at a time when there's a lot of teams that are sort of clamping down and saying like, we actually might want to take some stuff closed source because we're worried about someone taking this. Like what kind of got you guys as a collective, like comfortable saying, we actually want to just fully launch this in public as opposed to trying to keep it by some sort of like tight access. Yeah. I mean, I think we've been burned in the past before. Our code was, I mean, I don't even know if it it was open source or not. I I can't remember, but like some contributors or wanted to be contributors, right, got access to the code and and forked it and then we open sourced it. So it's like, you never know, right? Like just poor decisions, whether it's open source or not, can lead to um, lead to people like taking code. And even then at the point, at the the level the ecosystem is now, uh, there's so many quality Solana like developers that can build smart contracts you know, if they read a white paper, they can figure out like the mechanics and build something else, right? It's just going to take them sure. time. So like, I think as the ecosystem grows, it's not so much like the IP that becomes the um, the moat. It's more of your community and liquidity and, and other aspects of it. So that's where like the, the institutional market making and the, and the skills and partners there is is what will uh, kind of create the moat on, on some of those like trading and market making vaults. Yeah, that's an interesting point there. So as you're looking at sort of these two skill sets, right? The I, it, I'm really fascinated by this like one organization that's got these two core teams that are trying to do two very, very different types of things. Um, it's usually hard to balance different stakeholder cultures within an organization. This is like the classic example of like why, you know, a car company spins out their electric car division as its own company and then reacquires it later is like sometimes you just need a certain amount of distance from the culture and the politics of one organization to build something that's kind of radically different. What is that working yep. relationship like with, um, you know, the financial products side of the house? And like, how how do you guys navigate that sort of process of priorities and decision making? It's a great question. And I think it comes down to like our governance infrastructure or governance like set up too. 
And this is something I think we're doing that's pretty unique that we don't really talk about too much. Like in the very beginning, we tried to get a bunch of decentralized contributors and, and you know, get community to get involved. But that was a waste of money. Like huh. you get really bad developers, poor designs, like things are all scattered. Like you cannot move at an efficient pace to compete with any sort of centralized or pseudo centralized entity or organization if you're trying to do everything with in individual contributors across the globe. Hmm. Um, it's really hard to vet them, all that stuff. Uh, and so then with the like acquisition of Tap Finance, we kind of create this like s more decentralized structure than a centralized entity where there's two individual entities, but they are, you know, th neither one actually owns the other. But we're, you know, we have good working relationships. We get together once a week to brain share, discuss the ecosystem, discuss what we're currently working on, you know, kind of have share resources, engineering resources of, hey, you know, we're getting some traction on Silent. We need this feature. We need this UI improvement, whatever. Um, and so there's a little bit more like resource sharing as far as like con contributions to these different repositories. Um, but then there's still the autonomy of individual organizations. Um, and then at a higher level, the kind of council meets uh, at least once a month to kind of discuss like any changes to the bigger picture and where we're going. And and that's where we kind of talk about things like Armada and yeah. the interest there and how that can be beneficial to the broader uh, sci-fi organization. I mean, sci-fi is going to be the first one dog fooding all of, you know, most of Armada stuff. So. <laughs> so, so where do you see the right point to sort of bring community in? You, you, you know, you touched on the fact that like you tried early on to be like, help us build stuff. And like that yeah. really didn't work. So, so what, what have you found is like that right balancing act between like, bringing the community in enough, but not so much that now they're actually holding you back from developing new stuff? That's a great question. I, I'm not going to pretend to have the the answer, but I will, I'll, you know, I'll hypothesize sure. here a little bit. Um, I think it depends also on like the roles that communities are coming in, into. Um, I think creating sub DAOs for things like growth and marketing are a little bit easier um, and you kind of give a little bit more freedom to a, a group um, to make decisions on general community branding, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, like, I still, I don't know about like a bunch of individual contributors that are there for one week and gone the next, right? Like it takes a lot to like market something, to get, understand products in and out, to answer questions in discord, to write blog posts, um, you know, quality blog posts that actually drive value to the reader and all that kind of stuff. Like you really need that internally. Like you need someone who's like eating and sleeping this stuff. Yeah. Um, rather than, you know, some sort of outsourced group that's juggling 50 different things. Yeah. I, so it's it's tough. I hear you on that. Um, so talk to me a little bit about this sort of sub -DAO and governance model you guys are working on. There, there's a few folks who I think are doing some interesting work on this. I'd like to sort of get your opinions on too, which is like, the work that Helium's been doing, building out governance infrastructure for their sort of sub-networks type product offerings where mobile and IoT are different subnets. Um, and then sort of the proposal that Rune from Maker has had about how you can use the SVM and the Solana code base to actually create um, DAOs that actually have the power to even rewind state. Yeah, I mean, I think sub-DAOs are super interesting. I think um, I... I was at OsmoCon, was that 2022? Uh, and they've done a great job with like their sub DAOs for like marketing and, and whatnot. And so I think like there's, when you give power to, uh, to a, a, a more decentralized group, but a smaller group um, and, so, and, and delegate, I think it can be very efficient. Uh, so I, I haven't dug into honestly Helium's like governance infrastructure stuff. And we're like what we're building right now with Armada, like Fleet V1 and Fleet V2 is not even going to touch on like setting up sub DAOs and that mm. kind of stuff. I think you could still hack it together with Realms and SPL governance, uh, but we're still in the the phase of just focusing on some infrastructure and then building out like okay now now that we have like tokenomics that's governance light, not governance like relied heavily on governance voting every time and and things like that. Then I think we'll we'll focus on like the sub DAOs and actually setting those those things up um, to to start delegating 
like different sort of operations out. Um, but I think they're like extremely effective because it gets a lot for like if you have, you know, uh, if, if your core DAO requires a ton of community voting, like it is very hard to get the entire community to come to, to a vote. And so oh, if yeah. you're doing that frequently, like, like good luck, like it, it's not going to happen. Um, and I, I, and I most know... governance attacks, quite frankly, take advantage of this exact problem where potentially yeah. you can slip through a proposal to transfer a bunch of the treasury out and someone might not even notice even if you have a, even if you have like a seven day voting waiting period on that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you have to be thoughtful of like, you have to understand the community who can, you know, so you have to be thoughtful of like what your vote threshold is set to and, and whether there's a vote tipping, whether votes can like be passed early or not. Uh, and so like when you're setting up like those DAOs, you'd be very thoughtful of that. Um, so you want to make it restrictive enough that you don't have these adversaries coming in and hacking the DAO. Uh, but it needs to be, you know, uh, I guess low enough that you can actually get votes passed. And so if you move to a model where you're delegating uh, different aspects of the organization to like sub DAOs, you know, you can have different thresholds and parameters for those different DAOs. So it gives you a little more flexibility and, and I guess like separations of concerns and isolation, um, which is good for your, your DAO security. Like, you, you know, you can have really restrictive stuff on your treasury management, but like for marketing, token weighted marketing stuff, you know, delegate out that out to a group right, uh, or a sub DAO. Yeah, it's interesting. So what are you guys actually um, sub DAOing at this point? Right now, nothing. Okay. Honestly, like we've been, we, we've been, we haven't put anything into practice. Uh, we've just been focused on our, like the the core sci-fi DAO uh, and infrastructure there. We had some, um, we made some bets that we invested in treasury management and other integrations into realms, but there's just not a lot of DAOs, you know, actually leveraging all that kind of stuff um, just yet. Hopefully that, that changes. Um so we've been still kind of like focusing on revamping tokenomics, which like, okay, that sounds like an easy task. But once you put everything on chain and you've locked up like uh, tokens and, and grants that are unlocking over like two or three years and sure. and all that kind of stuff, like if you want to make a change, you got to write code to like be able to unlock those without, you know, creating some sort of backdoor or any issues. And then you actually have to like get those votes passed and unlock all those grants. And then you can start, you know, creating new DAOs and sub DAOs, or, uh, or uh, you know, maybe a staking program. Yeah. Uh, which actually, that's yeah. So. So, how do you balance that stuff over the long term? Or let me let me ask maybe a better version of this question: How is Armada thinking about how folks should structure this over the long term? So, for example, it, it's very easy to say, "Oh, everything should be done immutable," but I think as Something like Metaplex saw, if you make things immutable from day one, there's a whole bunch you don't know until you actually get into product market fit and product discovery. And the Metaplex protocol has changed dramatically since when it first came out. We'd be on like V37 at this point if each version that came out yep. were, were fully locked and couldn't be upgraded. So, you know, when you're looking at things like token economics and, you know, these other structures, how is how is Armada recommending folks think about when the right time is to do things in an immutable fashion versus a more mutable fashion. So we've just announced our our uh, st SPL staking program, which the unique aspect of this is it gives tokenized re tokenization representation tokenized representation of your stake weight, so it can be plugged into SPL governance um, without being like a direct without taking over the community vote plugin uh, nature of SPL governance, and so it kind of cr it creates the the change that users don't have to decide, do I stake or participate in governance? You're streamlining those two things. Um, and then the other program was the demultiplexer. And so the demultiplexer can take in fees from any program, and then it has different distribution weights and send those to different actions. And so it's very, uh, it doesn't make any assumptions about the actions on the other end. Um, and so that one will be pretty easy to, pretty, it will be easily Easy to make it immutable, excuse me, um, because then you're just building different actions or, or plugins that plug into the demultiplexer. And those actions can be something like it just simply sends to the governance treasury or by 
a certain token and deposit it into some other program for protocol owned liquidity or right. you know buy some other token or distribute in kind to stakers as like staking rewards or distribute to a liquidity mining program or liquidity mining incentives and so the goal is to make you know all these actions that that'll be fleet v3 We've, we're building some actions for the launch of uh, of the demultiplexer, but you know we're we can, we don't want to make assumptions, and we'll let other teams contribute uh, and p- provide input for what other actions should be built on top of it. Yeah, at some point, this almost feels like it's a this is going to be a, a massive undersell, but it, it's like a business logic construction platform in some regards. Like you you could certainly use this for liquidity incentives and marketing and, you know, all these sorts of things, you could also, it sounds like, take a lot of these toolings and say, like, this is actually how we're going to run the back office operations of a protocol that has, like, built-in revenue splits. Yep, exactly. I mean, so, like, partnerships on chain, if there's, you know, some collaboration, um, you know, you could do a a split, a a fee split from those, those protocols and send them to two different treasuries. Or you could stack, you know, these DMUX instances and split them and they go to the the other the two organizations DMUX instances and just feed into their tokenomics model. And so we, we're building this like UI um, that has all these these puzzle pieces and kind of can display to to members what a an ecosystem's tokenomics layout looks like and where the fees are coming from and where they're going to um, via the demultiplexer. Yeah. So what is the um what's the long term scope of what Armada should encapsulate look like? Like where do you draw the line and say like this is this is in scope and this is out of scope for what this protocol will build? Great question. Um a lot of the governance, like we talked about subdows and things like that, like we're not touching uh any like so much related to governance. We're just making it plug into SPL governance mm. and and realms and things like that. I mean, I think we'll see where Realm's code base goes. I think that there's a little bit more restrictions on like third party code and yeah. and there's there's definitely some like pain points that could be improved with Realms. Uh, so we'll see where that goes. But like in the present day where we are not really touching anything related to token weighted voting, NFT voting, governance stuff, um, we're building the tooling around uh, SPL governance. Um, so that that's at least one clear line in the sand. Um, TBD on on where things go. I mean, we're just letting now that like we have we've announced like the token launching and uh, the concentrated liquidity market making stuff. We've had a lot of inbound interest from teams, and so we're just trying to get really good at assessing the ecosystem needs, those teams' needs, and building to solve those. Yeah, is there like a class of tooling that you think Solana still needs to you know? 10x itself on well the token launching stuff right that's why we built it so uh we need good quality tokens so token launching and tokenomics so but not gonna you know just just pump our uh a little bit there but uh the other stuff i i think there's just i think there's there's a lot of good infrastructure but it's all very disjoint um mm. that's the pain point that like armada is trying to solve you have so many different staking programs you have governance all that kind of stuff but they are very disjoint. Uh, but I think there's a lot of infrastructure that that just needs to be tweaked a little bit. Like governance, the delegation process with SPL governance is rough to say the least. Uh, so it doesn't. So if you're, you know, there's a lot of VCs and institutions that will not participate in governance whatsoever. Um, Solana Ventures won't even participate in governance, right? So, but like maybe they would be able to delegate, right? Some say they can delegate. Some can say they cannot. Sure. Um, there's various levels there. But so, like fixing delegation and improving that to make it e- make it easier for um, for these in like groups and token holders that can't participate in governance to delegate to not just one one uh, you know wallet, but many different wallets, and making it easier for those uh, people who are receiving the delegations to actually easily vote with all just one go with all those wallets. Um, that would be a huge, huge improvement. Yeah, you know, it is interesting how it feels like stuff gets built and then it usually takes a year or two for it to actually get refined to be usable. To go from the idea of like, it's technically possible to do this to like, it's practical and actually easy for this thing to be done in real time on the network. 
I mean, that's like startups and product and everything in general, right? Like there's just lots of iterations. You need to get feedback and you need to create those feedback loops. So you guys are building this all sort of for your own needs and you're open sourcing it to community, which is awesome. Over the long term, like what keeps this going besides just another crazy bull market cycle where everyone is suddenly a quadrillionaire again? Like, do you think there's a model where Amada actually becomes like kind of a nonprofit spin out and asks people using it for donations? Or like, do you think it's just sort of like Linux where it's like, yeah, people just contribute to it as they need? That's like TBD. We, we floated a few ideas. So there's like some places that take fees and some some do not, right? The staking is not going to take fees because um, like, who knows, like there could be pennies going through there and it'd be rude to take fees there. Um but there could be like small transaction fees on like the demultiplexer. So like, but not nothing that's like makes it restrictive to for anyone to crank. But so like maybe just doubling the, the Solana transaction fee, right? Sure. Of just so many land ports. Um, and then the market making vaults, like those will have, uh, you know, performance fees taken out on them. Um, and so then like the token launching, like the LBC doesn't have any fees right now baked into it. Uh, and so we're viewing it more as like a top of the like funnel, um, you know, for getting people into like providing liquidity on the concentrated liquidity market making vaults and things like that. So, you know, I think the different programs um, and different UIs are going to have different um, like, like different models or different roles in this ecosystem. And, it, and it's still TBD. I mean, maybe at some point, like the programs are open source, but the UIs, right, like you have to pay for the to like host the UI or whatnot, right? kind of like um i mean what is that discourse right the, this forum the forum company yeah things like that so um we have a few ideas but we're just still in like such the early phases of just get people using it uh and collecting feedback so you know it, it becomes the best product and and creates a moat in and of itself yeah so Armada is a series of tools and tooling to make certain activities a lot easier on chain. A at some point, that sort of begs the question of, is this a services company or is this a GitHub repo? Uh, what do you think is the right sort of path there? Because at some level, like, unless you're charging a subscription, like, it would be pretty crazy if I could call someone up and be like, hey, like, I'm having trouble using this toolkit. But at some level, like, that is what is expected from the entire world of SaaS today, which are software tools to make things that you could do yourself, but you probably shouldn't do yourself a lot a lot easier. Like, do you see this as like a long-term SaaS play or is this something else at this point? Uh, I think like parts of it could be a SaaS play. I mean, like some things like the auctions, like you're hosting that for a week, a month at most, right? Like, yeah. so you don't need to host that for a while. The staking of tokenomics could be more of a SaaS play. Um, and it's kind of the the Red Hat Linux, right? Where you you know, there's there's more of hey, we'll just we'll we'll set it up for you, and you know, give whatnot, um, and you just pay it pay a regular fee. Um, so, it, but I think like that's that's the tough thing about like crypto and the open source stuff. Everyone still reaches out, whether you have a SaaS model or not. People reach out for help, yep. and you know, trying to be good and stewards of the community, you 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 ultimately help them instead of just saying no, like, sorry, yeah, I'm busy. You, you tend to at least like engage a little bit. So no matter what, it's taking away some of your bandwidth. Um, Do you think we need a better so culture a, of tipping in Web3? Yes. I mean, gosh, we're, I'm getting tips at left and right, right? When I just go to c get a coffee nowadays, <laughs> it's like, yo, you want a 20% tip? I'm like, what? Right. You just poured it out. Um so yeah, honestly, like I, I've thought about putting tips. It would be very interesting to uh, to kind of see like whether projects tip or yeah. you know users who get in, you know, on an auction or something like that would tip. Um, I've always thought that's one of the hardest problems to solve in Web three is that everyone is like a brutal self interested capitalist, except it's also all open source code and like isn't it great these people do it for free. And it's the, yeah. the, there's that long term. And it's um, not free. Yeah, no, it's it's not free to do it. It's never free to do it. Someone's paying Sometimes for it. it's free to use it though. Uh, yeah. And that, that long term dichotomy is always one I find fascinating about this space. Uh, so do I. It is. It's fascinating. Uh, it is frustrating. It is also definitely like very difficult, right? As someone who's like sunk like 
two, three years of their time like into it. It's like building a sustainable model is like not easy when you have that uh, you have that nature uh, like open source code, right? Like the fees are going to go towards zero at some point. Yeah. Um, so it's like, what is your moat? Where, you know, what is, what is, what other value are, at, are you adding outside of just the program that, you know, uh, is on chain that is driving value that other people can't replace? And so that's kind of where we, where we focus a lot of our time. Yeah. Well, uh, Tommy, before I let you go today, um, let me know where people can learn more about Armada and where they can tip you. <laughs> yes, you can learn more about Armada on Twitter at ArmadaFi. Uh, and the website is ArmadaFi.so. Uh, I don't have a, a tipping you know, address yet. I'm not going to read off an address, but you know, maybe maybe I need to set up TomJohn1028.soul and, and just tell people to tip me there. Or folks can just DM you a tip link, one of the two. Yes, yes, exactly. Great. Well, Love it. thanks for coming on Validated today. Validated is produced by Ray Belli with help from Ross Cohen, Brandon Ector, Amira Valiani, and Ainsley Medford. Engineering by Tyler Morissette.